Welcome to the Stop Ruining My Childhood podcast, a sometimes nostalgic, sometimes cynical look back at pop culture. Join us as we revisit movies, cartoons, and live action TV of the 80s and 90s and ask the question, does this hold up or did I just ruin my childhood? My name is Megan and this is a solo pod today. So uh, I will have some guests on and occasionally Steve will be able to come in here and there, but he is just super busy. So uh, sometimes it'll just be me. And when it's just me, like today, we're going to change the format a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to do a non-sponsored snack if you've joined us before. <laughs> and we're not going to have what is Steve willing to watch since he's not here. But we'll spend a little bit more time on the history and facts of the show that we're watching, uh, maybe even some historical time period facts, that kind of thing. So what I'm going to be doing over the next couple weeks, and if you're listening to this, they're they're already taped. We won't have any uh, promises we can't keep here. But over the next couple weeks, my plan is to take a look at something uh, from each year of the 1980s and then hopefully into the 90s as well, where we look at one thing that I think will not hold up and then one thing that I think um, might hold up a little bit better. So we're starting in 1980 and today is Bosom Buddies. Um, <laughs> Bosom Buddies was a show that ran from 1980 to 1982 and it starred Tom Hanks and Peter Scolari. Um, it's a show about two best friends in the whole world who work at a marketing agency who um, are unceremoniously uh, kicked out, basically, of their apartment. The rents in New York City are super high, and they end up finding um, a place to rent that's only for women. And so they decide that to have lower rent payments and to be around these cute girls, they're going to basically dress and drag and be um, women for part of the day or dressed like women for part of the day. And this ruse is supposed to bring on all kinds of comedic situations. So if you can't tell, this is the show that I did not think would hold up. And um, it's interesting. We're going to get into the history and facts in a minute. But it was sort of well received in the first couple of episodes and then the interest in kind of the concept waned and then it was canceled after 37 episodes. It's surprising to me that it lasted 37 episodes and it's not like it was a huge hit back then, but I wanted to see kind of what it would be like through the lens of 2024, basically. So let's get into some history and fun facts. Um, first things first, this is not exactly Tom Hanks' first um, credit. He was also in a movie, but this is kind of like the first thing he starred in. So in, in some sense, it launched his career. Um, and basically, it actually wasn't supposed to involve any dressing and drag. It was supposed to be more of like a buddy comedy series. And when the showrunners were pitching it to the network, they said, we want them to have kind of a vibe like um, the two guys in the Billy Wilder movie, Some Like It Hot. Well, if you've ever seen Some Like It Hot, um, the pair of men in that movie have to dress up as women. Uh, they're escaping the mob after seeing a mob hit. So it's a pretty famous movie from 1959. Marilyn Monroe, Tony Curtis, Tony Curtis, Jack Lemmon, um, and basically uh, Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis join an all-female band, and then it's really the height of screwball comedy, right? So that's kind of what the showrunners wanted, and basically the network was like, yeah, that sounds great. Put them in drag. That'll be hilarious. <laughs> So the so the um the idea of them being in drag was really not something the show writers actually kind of even wanted and so the cross dressing concept was um something that they pitched to Tom Hanks and Peter Scolari as okay look you're going to be cross dressing for the first couple of episodes, and then we're basically going to drop that, and it'll just be about these two guys and their friendship and other hijinks that they get into. 
Well, that didn't happen. <laughs> and the cross-dressing ended up being the central, like, kind of key to what kept a lot of the show together. Um, and as I said, people kind of, like, got tired of that concept. Um, so this was created by Thomas Miller and Robert Boyette. Um, and they are, thankfully, kind of known for a few other things. The producer, Robert Boyette, he is also known for Family Matters. Um, he did Fuller House, Perfect Strangers, which is not surprising because this has kind of the same tone to me as Perfect Strangers. Um, Step by Step, Full House, uh, Valerie for a while, which would have been, um, again, a little while after this. Joni Loves Chachi, which would have been right after this. And also he worked on Laverne and Shirley. So um, a lot of big name, like, TV series, like really a lot of them for ABC. And then Thomas Miller, um, who recently passed in 2020, um, he worked on some of those same things with Robert Boyette. So he did, um, again, Fuller House, Perfect Strangers, um, Family Matters, Step by Step. He also was the producer on Two of a Kind, which was the Olsen twins show that they did. Uh, after Full House, he worked on Full House, The Family Man, Valerie, Happy Days, Jody Loves Chachi, right? So you can kind of see that this is a team that's working on a number of different comedies. Uh, some, I will say, maybe better than others. <laughs> is this the best thing in their repertoire? Is this like, you know, Tom Hanks doesn't have this at the top of his resume, right? So um, definitely uh, kind of interesting. So this started... In uh, aired on at ABC, as I said, from November 27th, 1980 to March 27th, 1982. And then basically what happened is that um, I don't think we would even really know this show. It would kind of be like if you heard our episode Manimal. Um, a couple people kind of barely remembered Manimal. Um, similarly, Small Wonder had... Uh, a, a limited run as well. Again, like three seasons. 37 episodes is not typically enough for syndication, right? They usually want a syndication package with 100 episodes. Sometimes they'll go a little shorter if a, if a series was really popular but just kind of came to a natural end. If it had like, you know, 50 or 70 episodes. So 37 is kind of short for a TV series that did end up being in syndication and in reruns. And that is because NBC saw that Tom Hanks was in a little movie coming out called Splash. And that was in 1984. So basically what NBC did was they saw, hey, we have this little show and it's available for purchase, for syndication. There weren't that many episodes. We could buy it. This guy's going to be in a movie, but sometimes maybe the movie won't pan out as well as we think. We could kind of talk to him and maybe get him to come back and pick the show back up on our network. I think that's super interesting because that's what has happened in the last couple of years, right? Like something will be on network TV and then it'll get canceled, but there's enough fans that Netflix picks it up or something will be um, on Hulu and then it'll get dropped from there and it'll get picked up by Peacock. And that's kind of what happened with this show. So in the summer of 1984, NBC starts airing the reruns. And of course, Slash was a huge hit. And um, right after that, he had The Money Pit, Big, A League of Their Own, and on and on and on, and had this, you know, enormous, amazing career and is one of, like, our top movie stars. He also did some other things in between there, Bachelor Party, The Man with One Red Shoe, and Volunteers. And we're going to talk about Volunteers in a minute, um, because that's going to kind of come back into play. So Peter Scolari... Um, might not be a, a, as well of known a name as Tom Hanks, <laughs> um, but who is, right? Um, and Peter, Peter Sklari, uh passed from a long illness in 2021, but 
He was on TV pretty much nonstop. He had a, a small film part in 1978. Then he was uh, on TV starting in 1979. In 1980, he does Good Time Girls, which was also a short-lived sitcom. And he does that for 13 episodes. And then Bosom Buddies gets picked up. From 82 to 84, he does a couple of episodes on some TV shows. Uh, really popular at the time. Remington Steel. Happy Days, um, those kind of things. And then in 1984, he gets cast as a major role in New Heart. I think that New Heart is one of these shows that actually was super popular at the time that we don't really talk about as much now. And we might have, uh, for 1984, maybe we'll have to revisit New Heart and see if it holds up. But it ran 184 episodes and it spanned eight seasons. Um, from, uh, from 1982 until 1990. So it looks like Peter Scolari comes in in 1984. He's on it for 142 episodes. During his run, he was nominated for Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series. He was nominated multiple times, 1987, 1988, and 1989. During this time, he also does appearances on, like, Family Ties, The Love Boat, uh, Father Dowling Mysteries, The Twilight Zone. Um, he's even in the television film The Ryan White Story, which was kind of like a big TV film of that time. This is the kind of actor I really admire because you can tell how hard this guy worked. And I'm not saying that like big time movie stars like Tom Hanks don't work hard, but you know, when you're at the level of like Tom Hanks, you kind of pick your projects, you do maybe a movie a year, sometimes two, sometimes you can skip a year, right? But this guy really hustled <laughs> and he is in almost any movie or TV show rather that you can name from the, the 1980s through the 2000s. So he does a number of like short run episodes. He does even some voice work. He's on Pinky and the Brain um, and, and things of that nature. And then he lands another long-term TV show, which is Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, the TV show. So Rick Moranis uh, kind of retired from Hollywood to raise his children. And uh, this guy, uh, Peter Sklari, is the one who came in as Wayne Zielinski. And so he was the dad in the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids TV show. And um, then again, you know, really um, working through even until he was in uh, the TV show Girls, for which he won a primetime Emmy. Again, outstanding guest actor in a comedy series. Um, and he also won Critics' Choice Television Award. He was on that show for 21 episodes. So he really worked up until um, the time of his, his death. And I just think that I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about him because he also did theater during this time. I mean, he was in Broadway in Wicked. He was in Hairspray. Um, you know, it's just amazing to me that I think this is a name that we might not know. And if you saw him, you might recognize him from Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, or you might remember that he was in this. Um, but really, he did a number of things. And he also was reunited with Tom Hanks again in the 1998 miniseries From the Earth to the Moon. So it's kind of nice that they got to work on another project together because uh, they really do have some good chemistry in the show, even though the show is ridiculous. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it's not the best show in the world. But um, yeah, I think it's just really... Um, I think it's really great that they were able to do that. And it, it, it was kind of fun watching this just for uh, the performances of these two men who are just really great actors. Um, so a couple more fun facts. The main characters are named for two bars in Berkeley, California. Uh, Kip's Bar and Grill and then Henry's are these kind of like college hangouts um, that are just south of the of the California campus in Berkeley. So um, it's funny that <laughs> I don't know if the producers kind of hung out there, but um, yeah, it's kind of funny. So uh, Tom Hanks, um, Tom Hanks made $15 million in for Toy Story 4. 
uh, for this show, he was paid $2,500 a week. So uh, not chump change, but not, you know, that's the kind of thing about working actors. And I think we learned that during the strike too. like, they're, they're, they're making what, what for California is like a livable wage, right? Bob Saget, who would later appear in some of the producers' other work with Full House, he was actually kind of discovered by them because he was the warm-up comic before tapings. So if you have ever been to a, uh, a taping of a sitcom, um, most sitcoms now aren't really done like this anymore, but when they had like a live studio audience, um, which this definitely would have had at least for certain segments, um, many times they have a warm up comic to come and warm up the audience before the taping begins. And then sometimes during the taping, the producers and writers will come together and kind of retool a scene uh, and add some different jokes in to see if they play better. And the comic will do routines during that time period. Um, and so that's basically what Bob Saget was hired to do, which is interesting to me because very famously, um, even though he was on Full House, Bob Saget was not a clean comedian and kind of had like pretty filthy routines at times. Um, so yeah, he also had his first screen credit, uh, in an episode called the show must go on. He played Bob the comic. Uh, I'm sure it was a real stretch for him. The show was filmed on the same stage as the Lucy show and cheers and later also Frasier as well. So production was on stage 25 at Paramount pictures, um, which it's kind of neat that so many huge shows took place there. Um, the opening credits are interesting because um, I had a memory of a different opening credit. The version that I saw was on YouTube and it had a woman singing a song um, kind of like about friendship. I looked it up and that's Stephanie Mills with a song called Shake Me Loose. The original, when it aired, had Billy Joel's My Life. And uh, a different singer who sounded like Billy Joel, Gary Bennett, was basically doing a cover. So um, the show goes into syndication. It had to be replaced because of licensing rights. What I think is interesting is I watched the original, which is also on YouTube. You can see the original um, opening credits. And I feel like the new song kind of fits better. My Life has some slower, almost kind of sad parts to it. And it, it didn't really reflect the kind of goofier nature of the show. It also is, you guys, it's a really long opening. <laughs> it's a really long 1980s opening. Um, and we're definitely going to talk about it when, when we get into the full review and recap. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> It was, it was a little much. Oh, so I should mention that we have um, a couple other uh, people in this show besides the two male leads. We have um, Holland Taylor, who is also just an amazing actress, and she's had really a long career. You might know her from Two and a Half Men, Legally Blonde. Um, she was on The Practice for a while. Most recently, she's been on The Morning Show and also oh, Billions. Um, so I, I'm not even going to read you all her credits. She's been she's been acting for a really long time, and she brings kind of a little bit of gravitas, I think, um, even though she does a, a number of um, comedies. Donna Dixon. So Holland Taylor plays their marketing boss. She's a marketing executive at their firm. Donna Dixon plays Sonny, who is Tom Hanks' uh, love interest, basically. Donna Dixon has had some smaller roles here and there. Um, she's also married to Dan Aykroyd for, I think, 30 or almost maybe 40 years. Um, and I think they might be separated right now, but at any rate, um, they're still married. And then uh, Thelma Tompkins plays Isabel Hammond, who is a woman who lives at the uh, women's hotel. And so does Sonny, uh, played by Donna Dixon. And Thelma Tompkins played uh, the aunt in Family Matters. So it's interesting, again, that the people who did the show were really um, 
loyal to the people that they worked with. You know, they worked with uh, Thelma Tompkins again. They worked with Bob Saget later on. Um, and then we have Wendy Jo Serber, who plays Amy. And she is um, in the marketing firm and also lives in this hotel. And that's kind of how they, or hotel, <laughs> she lives in this apartment complex. And that's kind of how they found out about her. And she was also in Bachelor Party, again, with Tom Hanks. Um, but she also, you might know her best from, she plays the sister in Back to the Future, uh, Marty's sister. And she's kind of a working actress and a character actress as well. And again, she pops up like Home Improvement, uh, Jag, Touched by an Angel, Eight Simple Rules, Grounded for Life, you know, all of those things. Um, she passed away in 2005, unfortunately, um, from uh, a bout with uh, cancer, I believe. Um, so that kind of rounds out the cast, except that pretty famously, um, Tom Hanks met his wife, Rita Wilson, on this show. And I did watch that episode. So I ended up watching three episodes of this show, which was, you guys, probably three more than I really ever wanted to watch. But um, in season two, episode seven, All You Need Is Love, um, Henry, played by Pierre Scolari, is trying to date and goes to a dating agency and meets Rita Wilson's character, Cindy, and they go on a date and hilarity ensues. Tom Hanks had actually seen Rita Wilson. Um, she was in an episode of The Brady Bunch, I guess, playing a cheerleader. And he was watching it with his friend and he said, hey, that girl's really cute. So that was the first time he saw her. He meets her in person during the taping of this show. And um, they hit it off in a friendly way. They're both with other people at that point. And then later on, they reunite for the movie Volunteers. Um, and kind of, I guess, the rest is history. Eventually, they they start with a friendship. And then um, eventually, when much later on, I guess, they, they fall in love and then they get married. So uh, I just think that that is a really interesting and kind of sweet story. And you might think to yourself, like, why would somebody even do this crazy show? And um, the truth is that Tom Hanks probably just needed work at the time. He's a brand new actor and he's in Hollywood and here's this opportunity and it's kind of a goofy show where he wears a dress, but whatever. And then it ends up that, um, you know, he meets his future wife and in 1988, they got married. So they've been married since then, since 1988. And um, I just think that that's kind of a, an interesting story. Um, I know that it's it's similar to Conan O'Brien, who met his wife also uh, on a movie set. So we're going to take a break here. I can't play the uh, intro for you guys because it's, it's just a song. But I'm going to find a clip of Rita Wilson on the show because it is really it is quite funny so here you go so uh cindy what uh, what else do you do movies books walks in the park i belong to a choral group and i worship the devil that was on my list too likes music i'm sorry <laughs> you you belong to a choral group and what I worship Satan. You know, Beelzebub, Prince of Darkness. I can't wait for Henry to meet him. Oh, Cindy, I want to meet all your friends. Oh. Cindy also <laughs> likes to ski. So, we're going up to Vermont tomorrow, take a little ride. Mm -hmm. What the hell did she say? <laughs> Correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. You're a, you're, a, you're a daughter of Satan. <laughs> Ten years now. Oh, she's kidding. Sure, you're shocked now, but believe me, in time, you'll see it my way. Now, come on. Let's bring him here right now. Everybody put your hands together. Oh. Whoa! All right, we're back. Um, yeah, I highly recommend, if nothing else, that you guys go and search this because this they have this on YouTube just as a shorter clip. And um, the physicality of Peter Scolari's character as he's like, 
really enamored with the beauty of this woman and ignoring kind of everything that she's saying. And then as they realize what she's saying, uh, she flips up. She's been wearing what looks kind of like a cape. And then you realize that it's like for satanic rituals and she flips up the hood when she talks um, and how they jump back and everything. It's just kind of, it, 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 it did make me laugh a little bit. It's cheesy. It's definitely cheesy, but it definitely also definitely did make me laugh. That's a lot of definitely. But anyway, so um, memories. I don't have a whole lot of memories from this show when it first aired, obviously, because I was quite, quite young at the time. Um, and this is not really kids programming, right? But uh, what happened is I am I think it was... Tom Hanks had a movie coming out and I don't know if that would have been maybe the first toy story, um, or something else. Cause he's had so many, right. But, um, somewhere in the late eighties, early nineties, they had on TV land, like a marathon of this show. And that's where I first saw it. Um, and I, I kind of had known, kind of something about it like this is the kind of thing like people kind of make fun of it's almost like little urban legend right um so you know forrest gump was 94 toy story was 95 um and and then that thing you do was 96 and so he had a a, a number of really big movies at that point and tv land decided to re-air this show probably in its entirety. And I'm guessing it was like over a weekend. So I saw a number of episodes and my impression at that point that like, you know, 10, 11 was okay. So it's like a cheap ripoff of Tootsie. So if you've never seen Tootsie, it's a very celebrated film starring jo Dustin Hoffman uh, from 1982. Um, also has uh, Jessica Lange, Terry Garr, Dabney Coleman. And the plot of Tootsie is pretty similar to this show. Um, Michael Dorsey it was a respected actor. Nobody in New York wants to hire him because he's difficult to work with. He's kind of like a perfectionist and has a little bit of a temper. There's an opening on a soap opera and it's for a hospital administrator. So he dresses up like a woman, right? And it's kind of like a empowered Gloria Steinem. Like <laughs> that's, that's kind of how the character was described. And so um, I just kind of always thought that this show, like they saw Tootsie and they were like, Hey, what if we do that with two guys? And then, you know, a few less messages about gender roles and things like that. And maybe a little bit more crazy hijinks and misunderstandings, kind of like a threes company. Right. So the interesting thing to me is that Tootsie came after this show. That's like the first thing that I learned when I was doing research. I just never, I guess I knew uh, I wanted to pick shows from 1980. And I, I guess I just assumed that Tootsie was maybe 79 or 80, but it wasn't, it was 1982. So then I was like, well, is Tootsie a ripoff of this show? Um, it seems not. The, the screenplay for Tootsie was actually written, uh, inspired by a play that was written in the early 70s. And it was first made into a screenplay in 1979. And then basically there were um, various studios involved and, and some production delays. And so then it didn't come out until 1982. It was the third highest grossing film of that year. And it's fascinating to me, though, that to be honest, watching both of these, uh, I, ha I have seen Tootsie fairly recently. What they're trying to kind of do and say, it is done a little bit cheesier in Bosom Buddies, but it's really not that far off. And Tootsie is not my favorite movie by any means, but I do think that maybe this show deserves a little bit of credit for kind of doing that first. Um, so let's get into the recap. I watched the pilot episode. Again, that aired uh, November 1980. And it's really interesting. So it starts off with this super long sequence. 
And the opening is just Kip and Henry being best friends in what's supposed to be New York, but was definitely filmed in Los Angeles. Okay. And they're like going through the park, playing catch, um, being silly as they buy f- some fruit, um, uh, kind of that. And, and really you can't tell that the premise of the show is that they're going to be cross-dressing for like the first maybe minute and a half of this intro song. So around like the minute and a half mark, then they have starring Tom Hanks and they show him in drag and they, well, they have like a thing of them. One of them is like working out and the other one is shaving and they have the wigs on, um, that they wear when they cross dress. And then they have starring Tom Hanks where he's like in a full dress and then starring Peter Scolari where he's in a dress. And then they go to, you know, uh, also starring and, in in and, including or whatever for the for the rest of the cast um and 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 then they show them again just dressed as men having fun in new york and it's fascinating to me that somebody made this decision and again i can only think that possibly the idea was like they had told hanks and scolari initially that this would be kind of a gag for a few episodes and then they would drop it. Um, And then they would get rid of that idea and it would be like a different show almost. It would kind of be like a retooled show. And that maybe they would kind of like a lot of sitcoms put um, clips of them doing other stuff from that particular season, right? Uh, That's kind of the only thing I can think because it was a kind of a weird choice given what the show's about. And I kind of expected it to have more of like, you know, if you watch the show, like the nanny where it tells you every single, uh, you know, thing, like she was working in Queens and then she, her boyfriend kicked her out and then she went and that she became the nanny. Right. I thought that it would kind of be like that. Uh, it was not. <laughs> so, so yeah it's interesting to me and it it was like a two minute um a two minute intro so we see kip and henry um in twin beds in the same room in a really small kind of crappy apartment and um they are (laughs) woken up by establishment shot from the outside shows a wrecking ball going through the the apartment (laughs) and um that now they know why they got it for so cheap so they quick run and grab up a bunch of stuff and um they're getting out of the place and then we cut to them going into the marketing firm so in the marketing firm we find out that Tom Hanks is a graphic artist. Um, Peter Scolari Henry is, he does copywriting, but he's hoping that he can, you know, write something else. And we see their boss, Holland Taylor, who basically uh, is taking credit for their ideas, (laughs) and which is typical even now, right? And then we also meet Wendy Serber, who, uh, 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 sorry, Amy, um and she is really in love with henry and we have completely over the top acting at this point she's like hi Hen-. and kip and kip tom hanks is like oh hey amy and she's like uh-huh hi henry um and we find out basically that she's been trying to capture henry uh, for a while <laughs> she's had kind of her clutches on him or she's been trying to get her clutches on him i'll say i'll say that um so then we have um so that's kind of like the establishment of a few of the characters right and the the setup to the situation as is true of many uh sitcoms of this era in a half hour we have the setup the problem right then the complication and then uh kind of a resolution so 
they're complaining that they don't have anywhere to live. Henry's also very depressed about uh, this job that it, he just feels like, what are we even doing? I don't really even have talent for this. And Tom Hanks is kind of reassuring him like, oh, you know, it'll be fine. And you at least it's a job. And sure, you know, our boss steals all of our ideas, but we'll kind of get through it. And at least we get to hang out together. Right. Um, so we have um, then they're talking to Amy and they're like, you know, they're explaining we don't really have anywhere to live and that kind of thing. And so she's trying to get them to come to her apartment and they're looking for things and she gives them her address and they're like, well, we could at least kind of check this place out. We're looking for an apartment, whatever. So they go and when they get there, um, a woman greets them and is like about to basically attack them um, and she has a shirt on that says uh susan b anthony and they find out this is the susan b anthony apartment for women there's a sign on the door that they apparently missed men are allowed in the lobby but they're not allowed up in the rooms and they certainly cannot live there um, so basically then they're kind of faced with, you know, this problem that, um, well, we got to keep looking. Well, then Sonny, uh, is spotted by Tom Hanks and Tom Hanks has been much like Splash kind of bemoaning the fact that, uh, Henry Peter Scolari gets all these dates and he's never going to find love. He's never had love before. He's never even felt love. Um, and then Donna Dixon walks in the room and she is gorgeous and she catches his eye and he's like, we have to stay here. And then Pierre Scolari sees somebody who's kind of cute and they catch his eye and he's like, yeah, how do we get to be around these women? And also we could save a ton of money. So that's when their friend Amy kind of suggests uh, you can't stay here as men, um, kind of implying that. But if you were women, you know, you could. And so this is where the cross-dressing comes in. Now, what's interesting to me <laughs> is that, um, and I'll, I'll touch on episode two kind of briefly. I don't want to get into it too much. But um, what's interesting to me is that they don't really try that hard. <laughs> you know, when if you watch Tootsie, Dustin Hoffman really kind of does become unrecognizable, okay? And here, it, it's just Tom Hanks wearing a wig. Like, you're not fooling anybody um, at all. And they don't even try to, like, pitch their voices or anything. You know, a lot of times things like this, they'd be like, Oh, hey, there's, hey, there, Amy. Hey, Sonny. No, they don't try that at all. So it's just him talking in his normal voice, looking like Tom Hanks. Um, and I will say in this episode, there are not any, um, too, I guess, I don't know how to put it. There are not too many untoward jokes here, I guess. That's the best way I can say it. It's not like, end of Billy Wilder's movie where um, somebody basically falls in love with one of the male characters and they reveal that they're a male and the person says, well, nobody's perfect. And then they ride off and you're kind of not sure whether they end up together um, or not. There's nothing kind of like that going on in this episode, at least. It's just kind of, you know, it's meant to be a soft sitcom. I think that if this, well, you, I don't, don't know that you could really do this today. Um, but if you were trying to do it today, I think you would have to kind of make a some kind of a statement about people um, being non-binary or having gender and sexuality be fluid or something like that. Or, you know, if he's questioning his masculinity wearing a dress and what does that mean? And you'd have to think about it a lot more. This is meant to be like cotton candy. This is not meant to be steak. Okay. They're not trying to make that kind of a statement, especially not in the first episode where they're setting up the general, uh, premise of the show. Right. So basically, um, they're going by these, uh, these other, uh, names, Buffy and 
Buffy and Hildegard, um, who also goes by Hildy. So um, Hildy is Henry and uh, Buffy is Kip. Uh, and um, Tom Hanks really hates this name Buffy or his, his character rather does. And they, they basically, that's it. They get, they get the room. And uh, we have in that kind of thing, they go back to work at one point. Um, they finally crack down on the marketing project they were trying to work on. Um, and then their boss steals their idea and goes and you, you see her walking off with their project saying, I just came up with a brilliant idea. Um, but it, and then uh, Amy comes up and is like, you left your shoes in my apartment last night when you stayed over. Um, but then they get their own place and we have the full setup of what the show is going to be that uh, the two guys are going to be in this. Uh, I keep calling it a hotel. It's not. <laughs> they're in this apartment complex and they're going to have to pretend somehow to be these women while also ostensibly wooing some of the other women who work there, particularly uh, Tom Hanks and Sonny. And that is where the first episode closes out with Kip or Buffy saying, I think we'll have a wonderful time, just us girls. And then laughter and hilarity ensues and the episode ends. Uh, or not, because it's so cheesy. I will say, uh, you know, not to get into the full, like, full review, but what I liked, um, I really love Wendy Jo Serber. I think she she does a great job with a really tiny role in Back to the Future. And it was nice to see her here. Her acting is a little over the top at times, but it's pretty typical of acting in a sitcom in this time period. Um, Donna Dixon has a more understated performance, and she's just kind of a pretty face here, but in some of the other episodes, she has more to do. Tom Hanks is Tom Hanks. He has a little rant, very similar to one he has in Splash and one he has in Toy Story, and the physicality that he brings to the role is just really fun. He has great interaction with Peter Scolari, who... Um, also, they did a lot of improving, and and I think you can tell because some of the little quips between the two of them feel very natural, and they do feel like friends. And then um, Helen Taylor and um, Thelma Hopkins just kind of add some great flavor to it, and they're both uh, great actors as well. So I think it helps. You know, the difficulty is that all of these people they are doing their best right? It's just that the material is not great. And I guess in a good way, because if it had been better, Tom Hanks wouldn't have been free to do Splash and maybe he wouldn't have the career and we wouldn't have been able to see his great range. Peter Sklari definitely would have been able to do New Heart or um, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids or, or Girls or any of those other shows that he did. But I would have really loved to see these two guys in a in a comedy that um, lived up to their talent, because both of them are talented. And I think that would have been great. Um, so the second episode I watched is the second episode of the series. And I watched that specifically because, um, well, I was watching this on Daily Motion and it played through. <laughs> so the second episode started up. But what I realized was... It almost, and it did not air this way, but it almost was like a second half of the pilot because the first episode sets up, um, you know, as I said, how they are going to be in this hotel, the fact that they're going to be wearing women's clothes and pretending to be these characters of uh, Buffy and Hildy and all of that. The second episode we see more how this is going to work in real life because Tom Hanks does want to woo Donna Dixon, right? Um, Kip is looking at Sonny and he, she's his romantic interest. He's quite taken with her. How is he going to woo her and date her if he's dressed like a woman and if she only sees him as Buffy, right? And so the second episode kind of takes care of that problem. So we start off with... Um, uh, actually, a scene that did genuinely make me laugh, and this is the new um, 
the new ho- runner of the hotel, the new person who runs the hotel or the, the apartment complex, she is going room to room to introduce herself. She knocks on the door of Buffy and Hildy's room and Tom Hanks is just in his underwear, not dressed at all, and they can't scramble fast enough to get him out of there. So Sonny comes in with the new landlord, basically, and the new landlord is shocked. They obviously, (laughs) they jump to the conclusion that, um, not that, that Tom Hanks has been wearing a wig the whole time, which would be really, to be honest, you guys, the obvious conclusion to jump to, but that Hildy is having an affair with this guy that she had a man in her room overnight that she snuck him in. And so they have to um, figure out who they can say Kip is because he very clearly looks like Buffy. So they say that Buffy is, uh, they say that Kip is Buffy's brother and that he and Hildegard have been together for a long time. And then... (laughs) Um, they have to do some, some kind of dancing around. There is, um, and this I did find kind of interesting. The women of the apartment complex all have a meeting about whether or not Hildy should be able to stay, given the fact that she had a man in her room. And Tom Hanks now is dressed as Buffy, and he is kind of part of this discussion as well. And some of the women are like, she's a tramp, but I should know because I'm a tramp. <laughs> and some of the women are like, hey, um, including uh, Thelma Hopkins character, who's kind of like, hey, you know, she made a mistake. It's not that big of a deal. you know." And, and the, it's interesting because 1980, we're still kind of, this is network TV, right? Prime time. So I think that having conversations about premarital sex would have been Uh, still kind of in the early stages, especially because this is really almost from a women, a woman's perspective, right? That, um, it's a woman ostensibly who had a man in her room. And what does that mean? And is she a tramp? And should we kick her out for breaking the rules? And it really is almost like a college dorm in a very, very strict college, um, which I got in trouble for one time when I was in college because I went to a very strict college and uh, a guy and I were watching a movie, not doing anything, but we were watching a movie and it, it played past 11 and we didn't realize. And the uh, my roommate called basically the campus police to turn me in for being in a boys' room after 11. Um, and that was in... 2002 I think so now I just kind of find it and then I got a different roommate (laughs) for obvious reasons but yeah that's kind of what's going on here so basically the women decide to allow Hildy to stay and in the meantime Kip has hit on Sonny now that she's seen him as his male self. She's like, how can you ask me out in front of Hildy? You're, you guys are supposed to be in love. And then as Buffy, um, he tells her uh, later on in a later scene, he tells her, um, you know, Kip and Hildy have been together for years. It's pretty much over between them. It's been over for a very long time. Um, kind of implying, too, that Kip was there to visit her and just saying, like, you know, my brother really likes you. He's a really nice guy. This whole thing has kind of been a misunderstanding. So it's setting this up for, um, I kind of liked that they didn't fully resolve that. And Sonny doesn't like agree to go out with him right away. Um, but that it's kind of set up like this might be a little bit of a chase for a while. And I'm sure that they kind of played that out throughout the first season, uh, going back and forth with it. So while she's talking to, she, while Tom Hanks, dressed as Buffy, is talking to Sonny, Amy is helping Henry uh, change back from Hildy into Henry. So they've been in this meeting with the women from the apartment complex and, um, he wants to introduce himself. So this they're not in the rooms, right? They're still in the, basically the lobby. Amy comes back in and she says, 
hey, I know everybody got to meet uh, Kip, Buffy's brother, and here is Henry, Hildy's brother. So now both the men have their real personalities um, revealed as well as their female alter egos. And it gives the, the writers, I think, a little bit more opportunity to kind of play around with both personas and to have the men not just be in dresses the whole show, which I think is part of what they were trying to do. So I thought that the, the second episode, I ended up watching the whole thing because of that fact and because really it, it really did feel to me like almost the second part of the pilot. Then we come to the third episode I watched, which was the Rita Wilson episode that you heard the clip of already. And you kind of heard the funniest part of the, the show from that day. But this was All You Need Is Love. And basically, we start off with Henry breaking up with a girlfriend. He is at a cafe. And Sonny and Kip are at that same cafe. Kip is dressed as Kip, not as Buffy. And basically, I could tell that there had been changes made. So I went back and in my research, um, ABC kind of felt like the whole show needed to be retooled a little bit. Now, they didn't take out the cross-dressing aspect of this. They took out the person running the apartment complex. They felt she was kind of like not really interesting or needed. So they have uh, Thelma uh, Tompkins' character be the person who also runs the complex. So Sonny and Isabel find out about the truth about the men in the first episode of the second season, which basically allows them to have more time not cross-dressing. They essentially decide not to tell the other women in the apartment complex just to kind of allow them to stay there uh, and to not reveal their secret. Sonny eventually forgives Kip for lying to her. So now Sonny, Isabel, and Amy are all in on the ruse, right? And we also have a shift because Kip and Henry have started their own ad agency and their former boss... Um, again, played by Holland Taylor, she's like a silent or sometimes not so silent partner. But the, the, it seems like these changes didn't really help in part because ABC kept switching the time period or the, the time slot for the show. So they'd move it to like Wednesday, Sunday, Thursday, and people could never find it. And also... There was a strike with the Screen Actors Guild Award, uh, the Screen Actor Guild Awards, with the Screen Actors Guild and the American Federation of Television and Radio Arts. That's that's AFTRA. We've heard about this recently. SAG AFTRA. Um, they had another strike that occurred in 1980, so that cut short the first season. They tried to retool as well. The second season, just with the even with the revised premise, just did not fare well. And that is why it ended up being canceled just after the two seasons. But I thought that the changes were kind of interesting. To me, I could see why they made the changes they made. It was a little um it was a little less interesting that that Sonny kind of knew his secret, but I think that uh, I also didn't watch the first 18 episodes of the season. And I think if I had, yeah, that would probably get old after a while, right? So I think they kind of made some good changes there. So while Henry is giving the It's Not You, It's Me speech to his latest girlfriend, Kip and Sonny are having a discussion where basically he's like, hey, we've dated long enough and I want to take this to the next level, meaning that he really wants to sleep with her. And he's kind of pressuring her into having sex. And she's like, I don't really know. Um, and it's not clear if um, it's just that they haven't really been together that long or if this is something that Sonny has never really done before. And I think it's kind of interesting that they kept that purposefully vague. But he's trying to seduce his girlfriend and she's like, 
let's just let things happen when they happen. Like, why do we have to try to plan, um, like, let's get a hotel for this particular date. And like, let's not try to force things. Let's just get to know each other and at least take it slower, if not wait quite a bit longer. Right. And, um, (laughs) Henry, Henry's date is really mad at him and says that she gave him the best three weeks of her life. (laughs) And then he says, you said, she said, didn't I, didn't I take care of you well? And he says something like, you satisfied all my needs. And then when he says that, all of the men (laughs) at this brunch place jump up and and try to wait to ask her out. So she runs into the bathroom crying. She comes back out and immediately goes off with a new guy. (laughs) So she's not hurt by this at all. And uh, then Henry becomes really depressed and he's like, I keep going out with these girls. I just want something like you have with Sonny. So he decides to sign up for a video dating service, which you guys is the most 80s thing in the world. And he's going through all of these um videos of these women. He has to make his own video. I love it because this is like a specific type of dating service that came about after just regular matchmakers would set people up in blind dates and before internet dating. There was this like brief period where home video cameras and VHS allowed people to have video dating services. And so um, it's kind of funny. They see their boss has made a video as well, and they're kind of shocked by that, which is like, you know, she's a little bit of an older lady or older than they are, but she's still, you know, got it going on, basically. (laughs) And um, he doesn't think he'll meet anyone. And on the way out, he sees... Rita Wilson's character, Cindy, and she's recording her video. And while she's recording it, he interrupts her and says, oh, you also like this? And it's kind of like, you like coffee? I like coffee. Do you put cream in your coffee sometimes? I sure do. Um, So they have a cute little back and forth and they decide to go on a date. And the person running the ad or the the matchmaking service says, huh, meeting in person, who would have thought? And it's so cheesy. But I didn't hate it (laughs) either at the same time. So they go on the date. And then, of course, you kind of heard how that ends. She reveals that she is into Satanism. And um, this kind of plays into the, you know, satanic panic of the 80s, especially the early 80s, um, that there were these people who were worshiping Satan, and you know, sacrificing and, and things like that. And they jump back in fear and that kind of uh, closes out, you know, our episode. What's interesting is they really did limit the amount of minutes that these guys were in uh, their cross dressing kind of outfits. There really are no memorable scenes where they're, you know, playing Hildy and Buffy. And so I do think that was really deliberate. And it also kind of allows them to um, have the original premise of the show, right? That these are just two guys kind of having a fun time and, and being best friends and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, that's the show. Um, In terms of reception, this show has a higher rating on both IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes than I really thought that it would. So that was kind of interesting to me as well. Um, It has a 6.8 rating on IMDb, and that's from 4.5 thousand votes. And on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a critic score of 80% and audience score of 60%. So what's interesting to me is that some of the, some of the reviews, here we go. Hanks and the vastly underrated Scolari had impeccable chemistry rivaling any duo 
on television at the time. The pro and then another one says the program may appear at first blush like an imitation of some like it hot. At second blush, it doesn't really matter. Um, now, a more critical rating says simultaneously tawdry and timid. The show can't decide whether it wants to be Three's Company or a show for kids who won't, whose parents won't let them watch Three's Company. Uh, another one says the show had a dubious premise. Uh, Hanks and Scolari snapped out lame jokes with zesty impertinence. And I guess that's kind of how I thought I felt kind of about it, too. Um, somebody else says, it's impossible not to see Hanks star funny man power just waiting to be tapped. That's uh, Melissa Camacho from Common Sense Media. And uh, the other one um, with the, the snapped out lame jokes is Ken Tucker from Entertainment Weekly. I kind of agree with the two of them. I really expected to hate this show and I thought it would be funny to for the first solo pod um, of our podcast to be like a hate watch of a show that just sucked. And I was really pleasantly surprised. Um, I'm not always the biggest fan of traditional sitcoms. Um, the shows that came out later and not even that much later, but I did like Cheers, which is very much a situation comedy, right? It's all at the bar, but that had an ensemble cast and other shows that I have liked that are sitcoms, like um, Friends, How I Met Your Mother, that kind of, uh, The Office, definitely. Um, those have ensemble casts and have multiple storylines, which is something that I'm super drawn to. This, I mean, there's, there's a cast, but it's not like a huge ensemble. It definitely is based on these two men um, and... They look horrible in, in drag. I mean, they really, I can't express this enough. They are not trying. And they are wearing kind of like dowdy, like grandma type dresses. I mean, they're not, um, they're, they're not really trying at all to be attractive. They're not, although they're wearing heels and makeup sometimes, which is kind of funny to me. But, um, you know, the lowest episode has like a six something. The highest has maybe a 7.8. When you look at like episode by episode on IMDb, they're all kind of around in that range though. Uh, 6.9 to 7.2 is kind of the pocket for this show. In terms of my reaction, like I said, uh, I do think the reviewers are correct. You see the untapped potential or the beginnings of what are two really great comedians at the beginnings of their career. It's kind of like watching Robin Williams in Mork and Mindy or in his first appearances on Happy Days, right? You can just see the talent there um, and you can see like the potential for that talent. Now that could be kind of looking back and knowing how both of these men had like great careers, but I really, I think that even if you take those glasses off, it's kind of true. I liked their chemistry, I actually kind of liked the chemistry they had with the women. Sometimes the acting is over the top. Um, sometimes, as, as the other reviewer said, the dialogue is a little lame. And sometimes the situations, I would think if you watched all 37, it would get old real quick, right? So we're going to, um, when we do the solo pods, and probably when Steve's back on, although he'll hate it, we're switching our ratings to A to F, and doing like a letter grade, I just find that kind of more holistic than trying to like pinpoint a specific number. And also, um, I gave things numbers that were way lower. And in my mind, I was like, you know, this is like a B minus. And then I gave it like a six. And that it, it's not really equivalent, right? Especially because you think of an F as maybe like five and below. So um, to me, this actually is higher than I thought. I thought this was going to be like a solid D with like a little bit of interest seeing Tom Hanks early in his career. And as I said, I kind of enjoyed it. I enjoyed really all three episodes. I laughed a couple of times. Is the acting over the top? Yes. Is there definitely like that cheesy early 80s sitcom feel? And you can tell that these guys also did Full House. Full House is not my super favorite. <laughs> it has kind of similar like 
sitcom-y situations. And I think the comparison to Three's company is pretty apt. A similar kind of setup there where he's supposed to be gay so we can live with two women, right? That kind of thing. So having said all that, my score on this is kind of like, I guess I'm in between a C plus and a B minus. I guess a C plus plus. Is that like a grade I can give? Yeah, I'll, I'll be generous and I'll, I'll say a C++. <laughs> it's, it's high fantasy. Will I watch more of it? Probably not. Did I enjoy the experience? Definitely. Um, we have pre-taped a couple of these shows and there are other things that I really loved that did not hold up at all. <laughs> and I did not enjoy. So, um, but I really enjoyed this. And so, yeah, I'm kind of in between that C plus and, and B minus somewhere in that territory. It's good. It's fun. It's an interesting look back at some early careers of stars that we have seen in other things and maybe love today. And it's, it's kind of an interesting kind of piece of 80s nostalgia. So coming up next, um, we have a show that, so I thought this one wouldn't hold up. It held up way better than I thought it would. Um, and the show that we have coming up next also debuted in 1980 because we're going right straight through the 80s. And that is Magnum P.I., uh, a little bit different, again, for the solo pod instead of what is Steve willing to watch. What does Megan think will happen? I have planned to watch the pilot, I believe, is a two-part pilot, so it's almost like a movie. And then there's another episode. There were two episodes that had Carol Burnett in them, and I remember... Um, just really loving them when I saw them as a kid. This is a show my mom loved, and I watched it with her. And um, so my my plan is, I have to buy the episodes separately. So my plan is to watch the pilot, and then one of the episodes that uh, has a guest starring role with Carol Burnett. And I think that it will hold up. Um, it's a kind of like a procedural, if you've never seen it before, it's like a mystery comedy thing where Magnum is a rich, wealthy playboy who decides to be a private detective in Hawaii. So I think maybe like this, it'll be a little cheesy, it'll be a little fun, and we will see how that holds up and, and maybe compare it to this show a little bit in terms of the, the time period as well. So that's it for me. Thank you guys so much for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we will see you next week. Thanks everybody. 